Chance and fortuity often play a decisive role in people's lives. One such chance event happened to an 18-year-old German youth who had left his native country as a consequence of Nazi tyranny. He eventually settled in England, where he tried to enroll in the University of London. He was an avid reader, interested in both the arts and the sciences, but his first choice of curriculum was physics. However, a chance event altered the flow of his life and consequently the course of the history of psychology. In order to be accepted into the university, he was required to pass an entrance examination, which he took after a year's study at a commercial college. After passing the exam, he confidently enrolled in the University of London, intending to major in physics. However, he was told that he had taken the wrong subjects in his entrance exam and therefore was not eligible to pursue a physics curriculum. Rather than waiting another year to take the right subjects, he asked if there was some scientific subject that he was qualified to pursue. When told he could always take psychology, he asked, what on earth is psychology, he had never heard of psychology, although he had some vague idea about psychoanalysis. Could psychology possibly be a science? However, he had little choice but to pursue a degree in psychology, so he promptly entered the university with a major in a discipline about which he knew almost nothing. Years later the world of psychology would know a great deal about Hans J. Eysenck, probably the most prolific writer in the history of psychology. In his autobiography, Eysenck simply noted that by such chance events is one's fate decided by bureaucratic stupidity. Throughout his life, Eysenck battled bureaucratic stupidity and any other type of stupidity he came across. In his autobiography, he described himself as a sanctimonious prig who didn't suffer fools, or even ordinarily bright people, gladly. Hans Jürgen Eysenck was born in Berlin on March 4, 1916, the only child of a theatrical family. His mother was Ruth Werner, a starlet at the time of Eysenck's birth. Ruth Werner later became a German silent film star under the stage name of Helge Molander. Eysenck's father, Anton Eduard Eysenck, was a comedian, singer, and actor. Eysenck recalled, I saw very little of my parents, who divorced when I was four, and who had little feeling for me, an emotion I reciprocated. After his parents' divorce, Eysenck went to live with his maternal grandmother, who had also been in the theater, but whose promising career in opera was cut short by a crippling fall. Eysenck described his grandmother as unselfish, caring, altruistic, and altogether too good for this world. Although his grandmother was a devout Catholic, neither parent was religious, and Eysenck grew up without any formal religious commitment. He also grew up with little parental discipline and few strict controls over his behavior. Neither parent seemed interested in curtailing his actions, and his grandmother had a quite permissive attitude toward him. This benign neglect is exemplified by two incidents. In the first, his father had bought Hans a bicycle and had promised to teach him to ride. He took me to the top of a hill, told me that I had to sit on the saddle and pump the pedals and make the wheels go round. He then went off to release some balloons. Leaving me to learn how to ride all by myself. In the second incident, an adolescent Eisenk told his grandmother that he was going to buy some cigarettes, expecting her to forbid it. However, his grandmother simply said, if you like it, do it by all means. According to Eisenk, environmental experiences such as these two have little to do with personality development. To him, genetic factors have a greater impact on subsequent behavior than do childhood experiences. Thus, his permissive upbringing neither helped nor hindered him in becoming a famous maverick scientist. Even as a schoolboy, Eisenk was not afraid to take an unpopular stand, often challenging his teachers, especially those with militaristic leanings. He was skeptical of much of what they taught and was not always reluctant to embarrass them with his superior knowledge and intellect. Eisenk suffered the deprivation of many post-World War I Germans who were faced with astronomical inflation, mass unemployment, and near starvation. Eisenk's future appeared no brighter after Hitler came to power. As a condition of studying physics at the University of Berlin, he was told that he would have to join the Nazi secret police, 
an idea he found so repugnant that he decided to leave Germany. This encounter with the fascist right and his later battles with the radical left suggested to him that the trait of tough-mindedness, or authoritarianism, was equally prevalent in both extremes of the political spectrum. He later found some scientific support for this hypothesis in a study that demonstrated that although communists were radical and fascists were conservative on one dimension of personality, on the tough-minded versus tender-minded dimension, both groups were authoritarian. Rigid and intolerant of ambiguity, tough-minded, dot as a consequence of Nazi tyranny, Eisenk, at age 18, left Germany and eventually settled in England where he tried to enroll in the University of London. As we saw in the chapter opening vignette, he went into psychology completely by accident. At that time, the psychology department at the University of London was basically pro-Freudian, but it also had a strong emphasis on psychometrics. With Charles Spearman having just left and with Cyril but still presiding. Eisenk received a bachelor's degree in 1938, about the same time that he married Margaret Davies, a Canadian with a degree in mathematics. In 1940, he was awarded a PhD from the University of London, but by this time England and most European nations were at war. As a German national, he was considered an enemy alien and not allowed to enter the Royal Air Force, his first choice, or any other branch of the military. Instead with no training as a psychiatrist or as a clinical psychologist, he went to work at the Mill Hill Emergency Hospital, treating patients who were suffering from a variety of psychological symptoms, including anxiety, depression, and hysteria. Isaac, however, was not comfortable with most of the traditional clinical diagnostic categories. Using factor analysis, he found that two major personality factors neuroticism slash emotional stability and extroversion slash introversion could account for all the traditional diagnostic groups. These early theoretical ideas led to the publication of his first book, Dimensions of Personality After the War, he became director of the psychology department at Maudsley Hospital and later became a reader in psychology at the University of London. In 1949, he traveled to North America to examine the clinical psychology programs in the United States and Canada with the idea of setting up a clinical psychology profession in Great Britain. He obtained a visiting professorship at the University of Pennsylvania for the year 1949-1950, but he spent much of that year traveling throughout the United States and Canada looking over clinical psychology programs, which he found to be totally inadequate and unscientific. Isaac and his wife had been growing steadily apart, and his marriage was not improved when his traveling companion to Philadelphia was Sybil Ristel, a beautiful quantitative psychologist. On returning to England, Isaac obtained a divorce from his first wife and married Sybil. Hans and Sybil Isaac co-authored several publications, and their marriage produced three sons and a daughter. Isaac's son from his first marriage, Michael, is a widely published author of psychology articles and books. After returning from North America, Isaac established a clinical psychology department at the University of London and in 1955 became professor of psychology. While in the United States, he had begun the structure of human personality, in which he argued for the efficacy of factor analysis as the best method of representing the known facts of human personality. Isaac was perhaps the most prolific writer in the history of psychology, having published some 800 journal articles or book chapters and more than 75 books. Several have titles with popular appeal, such as Uses and Abuses of Psychology. The Psychology of Politics, Sense and Nonsense in Psychology Know Your Own IQ, Fact and Fiction in Psychology, Psychology is About People, You and Neurosis, sex, violence, and the media, with DKB Neos, smoking, personality, and stress, genius, the natural history of creativity and intelligence, a new look. Isaac's range of interests was exceedingly broad, and his willingness to step into almost any controversy was legendary. He was a gadly to the conscience of psychology since he first entered its ranks. He upset many psychoanalysts and other therapists in the early 1950s with his contention that no evidence existed to suggest that psychotherapy was more effective than spontaneous remission. In other words, 
those people who received no therapy were just as likely to get better as were those who underwent expensive, painful, prolonged psychotherapy with expertly trained psychoanalysts and psychologists. Isaac maintained that belief for the remainder of his life. In 1996, he told an interviewer that psychotherapies are no more effective than placebo treatments. Isaac was not afraid to take an unpopular stand, as witnessed by his defense of Arthur Jensen, whose contention was that IQ scores cannot be significantly increased by well-intentioned social programs because they are largely genetically determined. Isaac's book The IQ Argument was so controversial that elements in the United States threatened booksellers with arson if they dared to stock the book, well-known liberal newspapers refused to review it, and the outcome was that it was largely impossible in the land of free speech to discover the existence of the book or to buy it. In 1983, Isaac retired as professor of psychology at the Institute of Psychiatry, University of London, and as senior psychiatrist at the Maudsley and Bethlehem Royal Hospitals. He then served as professor emeritus at the University of London until his death from cancer on September 4, 1997. Isaac, who frequently argued that cigarette smoking was not a major risk factor for cancer, had been a heavy smoker until middle age when he gave up cigarettes because he believed that they affected his tennis game. During his later years, his research continued to reflect a variety of topics, including creativity, behavioral interventions in cancer and heart disease, and intelligence. Isaac won many awards, including the 1991 Distinguished Contributions Award of the International Society for the Study of Individual Differences. The American Psychological Association presented him with its Distinguished Scientist Award, the Presidential Citation for Scientific Contribution, the William James Fellow Award, and the Centennial Award for Distinguished Contributions to Clinical Psychology. Overview of Trait and Factor Theories How can personality best be measured? By standardized tests? Clinical observation? Judgments of friends and acquaintances? Factor theorists have used all these methods and more. A second question is, how many traits or personal dispositions does a single person possess? Two or three? Half a dozen? A couple of hundred? More than a thousand? During the past 25 to 45 years, several individuals and several teams of researchers have taken a factor analytic approach to answering these questions. Presently, most researchers who study personality traits agree that five, and only five, and no fewer than five dominant traits continue to emerge from factor analytic techniques mathematical procedures capable of sifting personality traits from mountains of test data. Whereas many contemporary theorists believe that five is the magic number, earlier theorists such as Raymond B. Cattell found many more personality traits, and Hans J. Eisen insisted that only three major factors can be discerned by a factor analytic approach. In addition, we have seen that Gordon Allport's common sense approach yielded 5 to 10 traits that are central to each person's life. However, Allport's major contribution to trait theory may have been his identification of nearly 18,000 trait names in an unabridged English language dictionary. These trait names were the basis for Cattell's original work, and they continue to provide the foundation for recent factor analytic studies. Isaac's factor analytic technique yielded three general bipolar factors or types and extroversion slash introversion, neuroticist stability, and psychoticist superego. The five-factor theory, often called the big five, includes neuroticism and extroversion, but it adds openness to experience, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. These terms differ slightly from research team to research team, but the underlying traits are quite similar.